in five, four, three, two, and one. And welcome everyone to this episode of the Relators Podcast. All right, let's get it going. Here we go in five, four, three, two, and one. And welcome everyone to this episode of the Relators Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Edwards. Joining us today is Fabian Costello, third generation ocean explorer and aquanaut. Fabian, thanks for being with us today. <laughs> Great to see you. So Fabian, I, I, gotta, I gotta ask you, I was doing this introduction, I was rehearsing a lot for this, and I just think, hey, what is an aquanaut? <laughs> I get that question a lot. Uh, well, an aquanaut is, uh, the, the, the shortest way to describe it is basically an astronaut underwater. Uh, it's the, it's the uh, liquid version of an astronaut. And, and I'm not making light of it because it really does require that kind of training. Uh, but to get a little more uh, depth to it, for those who do dive, um, when you learn to scuba dive, for example, you learn to avoid decompression obligations, especially in the first couple of, of levels of scuba diving, recreational, advanced recreation. And, and that's basically why you have dive tables. And an aquanaut is exactly the opposite in a sense where you maximize your decompression obligations. So you, you saturate in essence. Uh, and by that, I mean, you, you maximize your decompression obligations, but that allows for you to live and work underwater for extended periods of time. And in essence, um, when you, when you do that, I mean, there are commercial divers that work underwater under saturation. There are uh, military that work uh, divers that work underwater in, in certain uh, ways for, with decompression obligations. But the main difference is that an aquanaut lives and works underwater based out of an underwater habitat, typically, for more than 24 hours. And uh, a habitat is basically a house and a workspace underwater where uh, what you would consider a house at home on land uh, and your commute to work, of course, is the underwater home. So it's a, it's a really neat space and it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's an acquired taste or it's one that you've always yearned to do. I mean, you, you know, certain people can and want to be um, astronauts and certain people can and want to become aquanauts. And for folks listening to this on audio, Fabian's got a nice underwater sea background on a zoom background now. And Fabian, so I got to ask you, have you always wanted to live uh, under the water? I always wanted to live underwater. Here's a, uh, actually a picture for you. That's, that's an underwater habitat right there. It's called Aquarius. Uh, I would say that uh, I've always loved the ocean thanks to the generations that brought me up, my parents, my grandparents, and all the pioneers around them that were ocean explorers um, within the team. They, their, their love of the ocean, their experience that they were willing to share with uh, me as a child was really that my the, my backdrop and my background uh, in education. I mean, yes, I went to school, but I paid much more attention when we were on expeditions. So I've always loved the the ocean because I had really good shepherds that that shepherd me through my youth to understand the human ocean connection and that real importance, that fundamental importance of what ocean means to all of us, whether we're on the ocean front or a thousand miles away. Uh, now, what was one of the few things that you, I guess they didn't teach you in school um, that you wish they would be teaching in school nowadays? Um, obviously, you're an explorer. Uh, you're very curious about uh, the oceans. It's very, you know, it's, it's really unexplored. Uh, what's something that they, you wish they would have taught you in school? You know, science is a fundamentally important thing, whether we care about it or not. And I, I wish in some ways there was a, maybe even more emphasis on, on uh, STEM related topics in school than there is already. And I know that's shifting in some schools. It shifted quite dramatically towards STEM education. Uh, but when we look at what we're facing today, uh, a lot of the answers lie in STEM education. But we need to be able to offer that to young people in a way that's palatable, in a way that's enticing, in a way that, that's, that's engaging. And I've, at, 
you know, way back when, when I was in school, <laughs> I, I have to say that uh, it was all about the teacher. And unfortunately, I didn't have much luck with, with many of my teachers keeping my attention. Hmm. Yes, I was probably the quintessential ADHD kid growing up. And at the same time, there were topics that I look back on that I wish I had a better teacher or maybe a more engaging teacher in that I probably would have learned more from in school than I did. Luckily, I had a family that was very uh, deep into uh, science and technology and, uh, and engineering and all that. And, and it was really fun because I got to be hands on with all that stuff. And that really caught my attention. And nowadays, you know, we're looking at, at a modern world where people communicate all the time, but we don't necessarily engage each other in ways that are enriching. Uh, it's, a lot of it's frivolous, a lot of it's fun, but not necessarily deep. Uh, I keep going back to that word deep. But it's, it's something that I wish schools would really concentrate on is, is experiential learning. Because in today's world, kids are, you know, they've got so much stimuli, you know? I mean, they, our mobile devices, uh, uh, just like we're doing right now, really take up a lot of our bandwidth. And, and so if we can maybe incorporate some innovative ways to engage young people the way that they're used to in their daily lives, but really enrich in their experience by sharing some of the magic of the outside world, the, the non-internet world, um, in a way that, that they not only will understand, but will pique their curiosity. I think we'd be in a much better place because we'd be, as a society, much better educated and maybe much better connected with each other. Now, Fabian, uh, you grew up in a family, obviously, uh, where you were exposed to uh, ocean exploration at an, at an early mm -hmm. age. Uh, just the ocean in general, being around the ocean at an early age. Um, is this something that you could have escaped? What was it like growing up in uh, this family household? Uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, people assume that I was pressured into doing the quote unquote family business. And it was actually quite the opposite. We, I remember growing up that we were uh, encouraged to actually explore outside of what the family does and, and see what really is our passion. But just like most people, uh, when you're exposed to something that your parents do, that your grandparents do, you have an appreciation for it typically. Um, and whether you do it or not, uh, in the long term, you're, you're much better versed in that world. For me, um, you know, being the rebellious teenager and everything else, uh, I, I did go out and I and I was uh, I took them up on their offer to look at other things. So I, you know, in college I studied environmental economics. It was kind of bridging that gap between what we were doing and what the the rest of the world is based on, which is uh, you know the, the fundamentals of economics. Um, and it was a good building block and a good uh, way to to translate what we as a family have been doing and what we all as a society are are beholden to as a framework and trying to um, speak in a language that that people on maybe better understand the importance and the value of nature and of our ocean world. Um, I had my first internship at Seventh Generation, uh, which is a, an environmental products company. Back in those days, they were solely based on a catalog system. So you'd actually physically get your, your catalog at home and you would order the products from there. Uh, nowadays, you can send generation products everywhere in, in the supermarkets and stuff. Um, and I love that, that, that branching out, that, that kind of experience. But it, it wasn't getting me. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't really getting me. So I jumped over and helped my friend out in the interior design world. We were selling high-end fabrics to designers and architects and things like that. And again, it was another building block, but didn't catch my attention. Um, and I went on from there. Uh, and uh, you know, eventually, within a few years, I turned around and said, you know, what am I doing? Uh, you know, I really love what my family's doing. I really love ocean exploration. And I've been on expeditions since I was seven. I've been scuba diving since I was four. Um, and those things were things that really sang to my heart and to my passion. And if I were 
uh, not to be a, an archaeologist, which was my other passion, uh, I'd be scuba diving and, and exploring the world. And that's what I ended up uh, taking up. And I got to tell you, uh, for those out there who think, hey, oh, yeah, that was easier. Pusto, you know, family business and all. Uh, it Working with family, for those who work with family, understand it's not easy. Uh, and for us, you know, my, my grandfather was a, you know, was a was very innovative, very uh, out of the box thinker, but he was also very tough. You know, you you were going to work just like every other crew member up the, the totem pole, so to speak. And I started scrubbing the barnacles off the hull of Calypso for my summer work, uh, you know, and, and that you know, went into taking the rust off the engine parts and then eventually doing the graveyard shift on the helm and so on and so forth. And finally, I got to be a scuba diver on the dive team. Uh, and so that was a few years uh, of work, but it gave me a huge appreciation for what teamwork is, for what a small community is on a ship, and how, uh, how each one fills in the gaps where others may need help. Uh, and it really was uh, a feeling of camaraderie and enrichment and, and, um, and, and society in a way that's a closed loop system where we're all self-reliant on each other helping each other out. And that to me was probably the best experience and, and gave me even more of a passion for what we do. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, successful people I and mean, pioneers like your grandfather, they probably don't get to where they were by doing things the same way, by being conventional, by thinking in a, in a monolithic way. Now, what are some of the things that maybe your grandfather, your father, your family instilled in you that you now try to translate into your art, your exploration, <laughs> your own family. I like how you say art. There goes my daughter. No, you stay over there. Please. Good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it's, it's, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, nowadays I take away, and one of the fundamental rules is if you say that's not my job, you're off the team. That's, that is, that there's no place for that. Uh, you know, we work in very remote locations, very risky locations, uh, a lot of times unknown locations under, under uh, extraneous circumstances. So uh, people who work in this field um, need to help each other out. Uh, I'm just as much the baggage handler as I am the bus driver, as I am the team leader. Um, and I wouldn't do anything that I wouldn't, ex that I wouldn't expect others to do. So, uh, or vice versa. I, I wouldn't ask anyone to do something that I wouldn't be willing to do myself. Uh, and I think that that spirit of camaraderie and that spirit of helping each other out is sorely needed in today's world. Uh, and it's what really makes success. And that's what, why, uh, we've been able to do what we've done under some of the most difficult circumstances that, that work ethic, that, um, that feeling of teamwork uh, is probably some of the best uh, gifts that uh, I was given growing up. Now, when you're working in a, a pressure-filled environment, I mean, you're exploring the unknown. You don't know what's going to come next. What's the mindset you have to train for, prepare for, before you go down into that exploration? <laughs> expect the unexpected, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, in some ways I envy people who have a predictable, uh, daily routine, uh, because you can plan for it. Uh, for us, we make a plan knowing full well that the plan will change throughout the day. And most likely it'll change multiple times throughout the day. So, um, you may be going to uh, the depths of the Amazon, for example, and one of your contacts is an, an indigenous who's supposed to be your guide. And there's a set time and place for it, but you may wait another uh, half day, day, two days for that person to come because the sense of time is very different. The sense of culture and greetings and interaction is very different. And so uh, you have to be able to be flexible like this. It's always difficult to try and get a, uh, a, uh, an executive producer in a business setting on one of these media companies to understand this. But when you and so that's part of my job is mitigating those two worlds. Right. Uh, but to be able to go out in the field and be flexible and understanding and really absorb uh, that daily education and 
rolling with the punches will make for the difference between uh, failure and success in the field. And so when you're going into unknown places, uh, you're talking about things uh, from the mundane, meaning you're losing time and money, to uh, the very real facts of you may be uh, putting someone at risk in your, in your team. They may be getting injured or they may even worse, uh, may lose their lives. And that's not something that's acceptable. So for me, um, it's really about the flexibility and understanding that when you put yourself in that kind of situation, you have to be flexible and change the plan as needs be. So Fabian, I'm, I'm curious, I'm still trying to understand, could you paint the picture for myself and our audience, what you do specifically when you go down, what do you look for? What have you seen? Paint the picture on, on maybe one of your favorite explorations. <laughs> well, I'm going to quote my grandfather on that. If I knew what I was going to find, I wouldn't bother going. <laughs> <laughs> the nature of, of an explorer is going into places that are uh, outside the box, the unknown. Uh, and although that doesn't sell, the, I mean, that doesn't sell the idea. The, uh, the point is you, you go in with a certain set of criteria, a certain set of expectations or, or a, a checklist to check off. But the reality is that on your journey, you may very well encounter things that are even more interesting, things that are even more unexpected. Uh, and your, your path will most certainly take a turn left, right, uh, maybe sometimes 180 degrees. Uh, and that's, that's just part of the game. What do I do personally? I, I'm a team leader. Uh, I sometimes pick up the camera if I need to, uh, although I much prefer having a professional with me uh, doing that. Uh, and we always have a, a camera. I'll sometimes take B camera. I'm a host. Um, I am an executive producer. So that just is a different word for saying a professional beggar. <laughs> and as I mentioned earlier, I'm a baggage handler and, and as needs be, I'll, I'll drive the vehicles to take my team to where we need to go. Man of many trades. <laughs> you have, you have to have uh, multiple traits in order to be able to be in this profession. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a very difficult one and a oftentimes a thankless one. Uh, and what you see on TV or, or, or on uh, produced pieces on the internet uh, are just the, the cream of the cream. It's the less than 1% of what that project was. Uh, so I like to show sometimes the behind the scenes also because that's a lot of fun. It shows the humanity in it. But uh, there's a lot of boring stuff that happens in order for that fun stuff to be put on uh, media. I love that notion of what your grandfather said is that if, if I knew what I was going to find, I wouldn't go anyway. Um, the, right. the notion of, uh, you know, taking risks and, and then and being OK with diversions in your life. Do you th think that's a thing that's not taught or can't be taught? Or do you think that's a thing that people people struggle with in their daily lives? I mean, for instance, take COVID, for, uh, for example, it shook a lot of people up. You know, cause a lot of turbulence. You know, how do you, what's your message maybe to people listening to this going through a difficult time? Well, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in human beings. Um, humans, you know, when they're pressed to task can create miracles and they, and they can be tough. Uh, and, you know, just ask anyone who's gone through hell and back in their lives uh, through difficult circumstances, lost loved ones, or, or maybe uh, lost everything they've owned. Uh, or maybe a combination thereof, or or even in their own health have struggled through you know cancer and everything else. Um, those are horrible things that I hope and I, I I wish never wish on anyone. But when you do have to go through those things uh, because life has given you a certain set of cards, uh, and if you come out of it uh, on the other side, you come out of it in many ways a, a changed person and, and maybe one that's more capable of uh, readily dealing with difficult circumstances. Um, that's to say that uh, that's to say that right now we're going through as a as a global society a, a difficult set of circumstances that are affecting each and every one of us uh, economically, uh, many of us in, in, in a real health sense. Um, I know most of us probably know someone that's already been affected or has died from COVID from the pandemic. And that's uh, that's a horrible thing, but I hope that uh, through all this we we learn from the actions and inactions that we've taken, 
uh, so that next time we're better prepared. Mm. And, through, and we're not even through this particular phase. So uh, hopefully, um, as this becomes the norm in our everyday lives, we can roll with the punches, we can make better decisions, ones that make us maybe a little bit more comfortable uh, and more of sense of normality in our lives, all while respecting other people and uh, maybe have a better sense of what's our plan B for next time so that this doesn't happen in our lives again. Uh, you know, I go back to the, the whole aspect of STEM and, and, and just science in general. Um, you know, science, science is an amazing thing. It's a set of facts. And we know so little in the world that uh, as we learn more, we, we have to reassess everything. So science doesn't care about what we, you know, where we stand politically, where we, can, where we stand uh, economically, where we stand uh, physically, you know, geographically speaking. Uh, and that's something that, that is very interesting and something we can count on and something we need to be aware of. So I think, you know, as we go through all of this, hopefully, uh, it'll give us a, a, a better understanding and better appreciation for science uh, and maybe one that we can count on uh, for facts uh, when we need to make decisions in our lives. And sometimes those decisions are very mundane. Sometimes they are life and death. And we really need to, uh, to, to be able to ground ourselves in, in at least one common point for all of us. They've been some people self quarantine in their bedrooms, some go away. Yeah. Um, and some people like to go underneath the water and into their own homes. Uh, and I think that person would be you. So I'm curious to understand what Proteus is. What is this photo behind you? And are people going to be living underwater in the next uh, couple of years? Well, I, I want to be sensitive to people's um, sensitivities to the current situation and not have a mad rush for people to want to live underwater. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess scuba diving is the best way to, to uh, socially isolate. Right. And um, there's a, a, a very special project that I'm working on that's called Project Proteus. And it's based on some some previous um exploits from the 1960s all the way through now, which is building and working out of an underwater habitat. A few years ago, I got a chance to lead a team to live and work from the world's only under undersea labor laboratory uh, called Aquarius. So nine miles offshore and 20,000 millimeters under the sea, uh, which is short for saying 60, 60 feet at the, yeah, uh, 60, the bottom. Yeah, uh, and, um, you know, the, there's a very pragmatic reason for 60 feet. Uh, uh, first of all, air, uh, or, or more specifically, oxygen becomes toxic for long-term exposure if you're below that particular uh, set of ATMs or atmospheres, which is three atmospheres. Uh, so you'd have to start noodling around with trimixes and heliox and all that sort of thing, which becomes very expensive and, com and complex. But what it did allow us to do was to live underwater for 30 days, 31 days specifically, and look at how we can leverage that coefficiency of time that that platform allows us for undersea research. We were able to do over three years worth of scientific research in those 31 days with my then very young team. None of us had become aquanauts at that point. So we had to train. We had to uh, go through uh, all the processes and the emergency, you know, all these things uh, to be able to do this. So we were all freshmen. In this, uh, in this world of aquanauts. Uh, and here we are doing 31 days, which had never been done at Aquarius before. Uh, and yet we walked away uh, mostly unscathed, uh, definitely enriched, and at the same time enriched in, in, in terms of uh, education uh, and just wowed, uh, not only at the amount of science that we were able to do, but also at the experience itself, being able to reach uh, over 100,000 people, getting 3.4 billion uh, uh, impressions, uh, so on and so forth. But most specifically, connecting with 100,000 students live from the bottom of the sea throughout those 31 days and to be able to show them the amazing critters, the, uh, you know, the, the human ocean connection with why is it that every other breath that we take is generated by the ocean? 
you know, every glass of water that you drink is you're drinking the ocean. And so just trying to connect kids in a very fundamental way of, of the importance and just the majesty and beauty of that underwater world. I thought that was just amazing. So uh, Proteus is the next st uh, step in ocean exploration. Imagine building the International Space Station underwater and being able to have that, that platform as a common good and as a advanced research station for for bettering humanity, for being able to address things like COVID, um, you know, looking at chemical compositions that will be able to be synthesized in, instead of years, in weeks and months, to be able to find those next cures for cancer and pain mitigation and, of course, pandemics. Now, what percentage of the ocean is unexplored right now? So if you look at the ocean, as a living space, you know, all 3.5 billion cubic kilometers of volume. Uh, that's 99% of a world living space. I know that in school, we talk about 72% of the Earth's surface, but we're not thinking about the third dimension, right? So uh -huh. think about a, a living space in three dimensions. You know, our, our, our Earth part is very, is this little veneer. That's the ocean crazy. is an amazing place. Yeah, it's, 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 it's so awesome. And we've explored less than 5% of our ocean world to this day. So there's a lot left to explore. And there's a lot of mapping going on and everything else. But there's so much out there that we as human beings need to go and do, including sending out ROVs and AUVs and submersibles. But us as human beings going out as aquanauts and scuba divers to really experience and bring back that knowledge, not only the biochem, but, you know, engineering and um, just going out there as a marine biologist or or even an astronaut to train underwater. I mean, there's so much there uh, that we still need to leverage to be able to to not only benefit ourselves in the short term, but also make better decisions in the long term. Uh, aquanauts, astronauts, knots comes from the Latin word sail. You know, space sailor, no. now you're water sailor. Now, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm curious because it, it seems to me like a lot of people are almost hypnotized by the Mars exploration. Um, but it was really odd for me from hearing from my parents how crazy and how cool the moon shot was with Kennedy in office. You know, we're going to you know go to the moon and we put it the first man on the moon. Haven't been back since, but put the first man on the moon. It was big news. And then here we have SpaceX. You have uh, video cameras inside the the rocket, right? And you, and you go up and you know a, a fascinating feat. Yeah, it seemed like almost no one really cared about it. Um, do you think people have changed in, in terms of exploration and what excites them? And, and why do you think that is? Well, you know, all you have to do is read a couple of, of books on exploration and it gets your curiosity. It, it goes back to the fundamentals of what makes us human beings, right? Emotions and, and, per, and, and stories that we tell each other to, uh, to really kind of it, just share. Uh, it, Exploration in general is really exciting. It's some people may think, oh, I'm glad I'm not doing that. That's that's crazy. Some people may aspire to do that because it's just so thrilling sounding. Uh, many people may say, wow, that's really cool. And I'm glad I'm experiencing this virtually by these people who are doing these things. You know, as we look forward into us as a society, the global society as a species, uh, we become very philosophical. We become very curious about what our evolutionary next step is. And it's only normal to look at space and, and inner space, meaning ocean, uh, as far as where we go from here, both physic physically and uh, and physiologically, I mean, and, and I'm sorry, and, and psychologically, do we evolve uh, and become more wise by sitting back in, uh, in, a, in a lounger? Probably not. By pushing the boundaries and going into the unknown and experiencing these new things by learning from uh, new parameters, new uh, physical uh, and, and psychological parameters that have been breached, we can learn more about ourselves. We can learn more about our trajectory in life. And, you know, that said, you know, not everyone's going to live under the sea in an underwater habitat. And certainly very few people are uh, going to be living uh, in colonies on Mars and Europa and such, at least in the foreseeable future. But the idea of it is really exciting. 
the idea of pushing the limits of you know, using new technologies to go beyond uh, what we've been capable of uh, is what drives space exploration, is what drives inner space exploration, ocean exploration, is what drives you know, new ways to uh, dive into our brains. Mm. And for me, that's really exciting. You know, it gives us a sense of purpose. It gives us a sense of, of it, it gives us the fuel in the tank of emotions to uh, turn the page and to read what's next. Right. The curiosity, what, what's out there? Is there any life, you know, and then what's down there? And and think the fascinating for me, I interviewed a guy that worked at NASA for a while, and he was talking about the spinoffs that come from these moon shots, these, you know, I guess it'd be the C4 uh, shots, <laughs> I guess, if you will. You know, what technology has come from these big ideas, um, the unknown, things like that? Has there been any new technology, uh, Fabian, that you have come across or that has been built because of uh, the moonshot approach? Yeah, I mean, you know, every time we explore somewhere, we have to be very versatile in finding a way to create tools to uh, either analyze something or to take that next fin step. Because we as physical beings are fairly fragile and fairly limited, but we uh, as psychological beings have uh, unlimited uh, imagination if we let ourselves. And that allows for us to create new things, uh, new solutions, new technologies, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, when when the 1960s came and we did that first moon landing, that really was uh, an amazing step forward in technology at that point. Uh, and nowadays, you know, I'm, I'm looking down at my phone, and my phone probably has 100 times more uh, power and uh, an analytic power than what, uh, than what they had in their space lander. Uh, and yet they were still able to do that. I mean, that takes brass. That takes a lot of brass. And I think nowadays, um, with the technologies that we have, uh, we, we might think we have very advanced technologies, but to be able to go to a place like Mars, looking at uh, SpaceX and NASA and the European Space Union and so on and so forth, they're really struggling with today's technology to think of a way to get there safely. But if you look at their future projects and other people's future projects, the, the creativity in the new technologies with the solar sails and so on and so forth really bring about a lot of, of interesting uh, mojo to say, you know what? We are going to make it out there. We are going to be able to colonize these places because of the human spirit. And it's the same thing in the ocean, although we're a little bit behind in terms of some of the technologies. A lot of the technologies developed today are in symbiotic relationship with space technology. And that's really exciting because, you know, I'm looking at, for example, a few years ago, we used a, a, a small piece of kit called the Edgertronic camera. And it essentially was a $5,000 piece of technology that you can buy off the shelf today that shot up to 20,000 frames a second. Just a year prior to that, that same camera technology for the professionals cost over $280,000 mm. to buy. And so, you know, not only is it a, an exercise in miniaturization, it's also an exercise in, in affordability and being able to be efficient about doing and exploring technologies to offer this to those who need it. For us, it was about biomimicry. It was looking at what the naked eye can't see in a blink of an eye. And so if you can shoot an animal's behavior that you can't see with the naked eye, but you can see with that biomimicry, we can then analyze that, that motion, the uh, mechanics of that motion, and use that and duplicate that in technologies that we need for inner space and space exploration. You know, it sounds very similar to an organization called Singularity University, and they they talk a lot about mm -hmm. Moore's law, um, that technology is going to either, you know, uh, double in efficiency or half its costs in like two years or whatever cycle it's on. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, the the business case that they present is the world's greatest challenges, the world's greatest problems, but also the world's greatest business opportunities. What is the economic value uh, for business owners, funders? 
um, people with uh, large sources of capital to invest in the oceans. I mean, we see an, an ocean act exploration, an ocean living. I mean, we see sea levels rising, but if we're able to build homes and highways and, and, and communities <laughs> underwater, I mean, that solves that problem, that thinking. If we're a people of tools, <laughs> you know, what, what is the business case right now for uh, investing in ocean exploration? You know, that's a great question and one that's not asked often enough. Uh, Ray Dalio uh, has a quote, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, from OceanX saying that there's a lot more value in, in ocean exploration than space exploration. I hmm. forgot the exact quote, but essentially he's putting all, he's putting his money into ocean exploration. And whether it's for uh, going out there and looking at the resources that the ocean can provide us, preferably in a sustainable way, actually, uh, mandatorily in a sustainable way these days. Uh, whether it's energy, look at OTEC, ocean thermal energy, for example. Uh, theoretically, there's enough energy in the ocean through ocean thermal energy to provide us with nine times today's energy needs, globally speaking. Now, that's a bit of a fallacy in the sense that uh, you know, there's a there's a there's an efficiency coefficient, and uh, OTEC is not a panacea, just like uh, many of the other technologies are not either. But to be able to uh, integrate in a, a global energy system, OTEC and wave action and um, uh, salinity uh, uh, energy generation and thermal energy generation, and then solar and wind and so on and so forth, we can have a very robust energy grid, globally speaking. Uh, and locally speaking, that will provide us with more energy than we'll ever need, all while having backup systems and being, um, if done properly, uh, in balance with nature so that we don't have a, any more of a negative impact. And that's mm. just energy. Now, imagine uh, all the, the, the I mentioned biochem earlier. Imagine all the things that we can extract and synthesize so that we don't have an impact on the ocean. Look at what we've, ex we've done so far today in biochem with the ocean. A deep water sponge has a chemical composition that's now being used in, uh, in, in targeted uh, leukemia treatments for cancer. In uh, pain mitigation, we've extracted a chemical composition from the most venomous animal on the planet, which is a cone snail, which is an ocean animal. And we've been able to synthesize it, and it's a thousand times more efficient and more potent than morphine without any of the side effects. And that's being that that's that just got sold on the market uh, for thirty-eight million dollars by a body Wow. Uh, the, the 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 answers you know keep rolling off my tongue, but you know, and that's in the context of the fact that we explored less than five percent of our ocean world to date. That's not including all the microcosmic uh, aspects of uh, studies that we haven't done yet. Now, put together with that, all the things that we're facing today, you mentioned climate change. Uh, by being able to have a real uh, finger on the pulse of our ocean, we can stand to start becoming proactive in our, um, in our decision making on land when we're talking about violent storms and so on. So rather than being reactive, right now we're being reactive, which unfortunately costs us a huge amount of loss both economically and in human lives because of the fact that we don't have the tools and the information necessary in the time necessary to prevent the problem, right? So when a, when a hurricane comes through, we have a couple, a day or two or a couple of days, maybe a week uh, to prepare people for the impending problem. Hmm. Imagine if we had weeks, maybe even months to prepare how many lives we could save, how much we could uh, mitigate the, 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 the issue and save huge amounts economically, both on a government level and as well on a, on a household level. I mean, the, 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 the list goes on and on and on as to why we should invest in ocean exploration, why we should invest in ocean technology. So your message now to people listening to this that are inspired like I am and, and like mine's racing right now, what's your message? Why should they be curious about space or uh, underwater exploration? Well, you know, you, at the end of the day, ocean is life. No ocean, no life. No mm. healthy ocean, no healthy future. Mm. And we are, 
are all beholden to the ocean, whether we like the ocean or not, whether we think of the ocean as a vacation spot or as the essence of every other breath that we take and every glass of water that we drink. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the mitigators for our crops, for uh, migratory uh, cycles of various species that we depend on for, for food, uh, the, the, the breeding cycles and so on and so forth. Uh, a small example would be the blue fin tuna, which is the poster child, uh, kind of the, uh, the lion uh, or the panda bear, if you will, of the ocean. And the blue fin tuna in the Atlantic, for example, starts in the Mediterranean Sea, migrates across the Atlantic, goes down the east coast of the Atlantic and into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, during that process, because of uh, the, our fishing practices, those numbers of bluefin tuna in the Atlantic are down to less than 2% of their original numbers because we're way too efficient at polishing off all the adults. On top of which, they're faced with a real crisis in the Gulf where they spawn, they aggregate and spawn, they, re they reproduce in the Gulf. So the Gulf oil spill, for example, is a huge problem for animals such as them because that spill will wipe out generations of bluefin tuna before they're even born. And so that's a real problem for us as a species, depending on that source mm. for economics and for food. Uh, and it's a real problem that we can tackle if we look at the problem in innovative ways and create uh, sustainable solutions. And I hate that word, but sustainable solutions, both on an environmental level, as well as on a business level. And that's long-term sustainability for not only nature, but for ourselves and for our businesses. Uh, I'm a big proponent of encouraging CEOs who have children of, them, of their own to make better decisions for the long-term profitability of their business mm. and for their shareholders and for uh, the balance of their decision-making process with nature. Because at the end of the day, nature doesn't care about us, but we should be caring about nature because it's our life support system. And the ocean is the very epicenter of all of this. Um, two things. My first question is this. What rubs you the wrong way about the word sustainable? Well, I think sustainable is being overused a little bit like uh, back in the uh, early days of ecotourism. People mm. used ecotourism. And as a, as, a, as a philosophy, it's a great idea. Mm. But unfortunately, it's been bastardized by people who may have less than the ideal uh, way of approaching it. Mm. And they use it as a marketing tool rather than a real fundamental um, uh, philosophy. Uh, and, and so sustainability has also had a, a bit of a checkered, uh, a checkered um, uh, past as well because of its misuse. Uh, sustainability also is a very easy word to use, but not an easy word to uh, implement. Mm. Because it, it, it does imply a balance and we, we breathe, therefore we have a negative impact. And so to be able to balance that negative impact with a positive proactive impact is not as easy as it sounds for several reasons. One of them being that for many, many, many decades since the Industrial Revolution, if not earlier, we've never taken into account in our balance sheets the environmental impact because everything has been taken for granted. Everything in nature has been taken for free when in actuality, there is a very real cost to it mm -hmm. and never been translated in an economic cost until now. And so when you use the word uh, sustainability, what is the value of the life of a fish? What is the value of the life of a panda bear? What is the value of the life of a tree? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's very hard to quantify. And when we say we're, we're, we're working sustainably towards something, we look at maybe at best the first layer of what that means, but never all the other related layers that makes that first layer, layer available to us. So that tree, that, that's, that fish, that panda bear, what about all the things that made that exist in the first place? And so we really need to take a, a long, hard look at our language. And I propose three things. Let's change our language. First of all, there is no such thing as a way. You cannot throw something away. This is a closed loop system. So with, what, regardless of what you're throwing, it's not a way. Number two, 
if we started looking at uh, our language and looking at it in a way that that reflects respect towards our ocean, we need to stop calling it seafood and start calling it sea life. We do the same thing on land. We call cows cows. We call uh, rabbits rabbits. We, well, of course, when it ends up in our play, we call it food. But at that very basis, when we're looking at those live animals, we see them as live animals. In the ocean, because it's separated by that blue veneer, we don't necessarily think of it as life. And I think that's, some, that's where a big mistake we're making. Uh, and third, you know, we, we are all part of the, uh, of the problem, whether we're doing good things or not. Uh, we, as human beings, as individuals, we're the ultimate decision makers in our daily lives, in our homes, in our businesses, and in our governments. Uh, and we can very easily stop uh, making as much of a negative impact, start making a better impact, both for ourselves and for our planet by choosing better alternatives and single-use plastics and such. Um, and it's, again, about encouraging those businesses to cater to our wants, our needs, and our, um, and our demands uh, so that we can continue to be uh, their clients, mm. their customers, rather than choosing a different provider. So uh, I, I'm all for encouraging people. But at the same time, we are responsible, each and every one of us, not me, Fabian Cousteau, not you, but each and every one of us is responsible for making a positive impact. Yeah, Fabian, that's a really good point you brought up as well, you know, the, the, in terms of the word sustainable, in terms of uh, adding a value or a cost to a sea life like we do to animals on land. And I think it really is an apolitical matter. It's also something that is confusing for a lot of people as well. Um, how it can be a political, for instance, conservationists, and I am not a hunter by any means at all. Um, but a lot of people uh, have problems with hunters who pay, you know, 11% tax on any bullets or anything like that, that provides billions of dollars to nature preservation to then hunt again. It's an odd concept to think about, right? Now, I don't know anything about fish or industrial uh, fishing for sea life. Now I'm going to continue to use that word sea life. But do people, I mean, I feel, I feel like people are just raping the oceans right now. I mean, is there a tax or is there a business case that we can implement like conservationists, like hunting, like wildlife and treat it in the same way that we can preserve these oceans to then hunt again and, and you know, get, you know, thus grow the populations? That is an excellent question. And unfortunately, the ocean has always been taken advantage of. It's, it's the Wild West in many right. ways. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it, people see it as this endless resource for way too many decades. We're, we've um, fished out over 60% of our world's wild fish stocks. We are down to less than 10% of our pelagics, meaning um, sharks and um, uh, billfish and things like that, and, and tuna. Uh, we're, we're on the cusp of a, of a major extinction, uh, the sixth extinction, as it's called. By the, for the first time ever by one species ourselves. But we're smart enough to know this. Are we wise enough to make the, the proper decisions? If you look at the biomass on the planet, 95% of the planet's biomass is now represented by human beings and domesticated animals. That's how much we've changed the landscape of our planet. And so the wild animals that are left are uh, very few and far between. So I'm not at all against uh, hunting in a way that is respectful to the environment if it's done in a proper way with regard to the animals that, are, that, are, that you're allowed to do that with, you know, deer, things like that. I personally am not a hunter. I'm not a fisherman. I'm, I'm a terrible fisherman. Um, but if you're doing it for food, uh, you know, I, I get it. I get it. Uh, but if you're doing it for sport, uh, it, it does have something that, that bothers me a little bit to it. I won't judge on that, but it, I understand it. I, I don't agree with it, but I understand it. But more importantly than any of this, it's about managing our resources in a way that's not only respectful to the resources themselves, meaning the, the, the flora and fauna of the planet, but to our future. 
And for that, we need to look at it in very basic terms as a natural resource bank account. And that bank account is going bankrupt. And so we need to not only protect what's left, but reinvest in that capital so that we can live off the interest that it bears rather than eating away what's left of the capital. Because at the end of the day, we can't afford to go bankrupt because no one's going to bail us out. And so really, it's all about us. It's about our future and our survival as a species. So leadership now, uh, you know, what decisions are you going to make today that are going to impact tomorrow? That's something that's kind of been a theme of the last few examples you provided. <laughs> um, what, what is the leadership needed uh, to preserve uh, the biomass in the oceans, to explore what we don't know? What is the leadership needed in today's day and age to make that happen? I think leadership in the ocean is just leader is representative of, of the definition of leadership in general, uh, which is uh, something that encompasses within a person uh, taking initiative that leads with in integrity and example that uh, that dares to dream that sometimes takes uh, take uh, a, a stance or a, makes a decision on behalf of the betterment and in in the um, in the um, uh, maybe the, the betterment of, of society uh, for the for the greater good, rather than uh, putting oneself, uh, it's really about the public good. Uh, being a, a good leader is being willing to do what you're asking other people to do. Uh, it's not looking to other people to solve the problem. It's looking to yourself to be part of the solution uh, and to be willing to get in the trenches with other people to make those things happen. You need to understand your audience. Uh, you need to be able to seek to empower people, seek to, to make them part of that solution rather than blaming others, because we're never going to get out of this mess if we do. So, you know, it, it, it's uh, a true leader is someone with, with integrity, uh, someone with uh, the, the, the desire to move forward uh, regardless of circumstances and to charge into the darkness in order to find the light. Fabian, hey, that's a great quote in the last one. And that's why I want to ask you this question. We've talked about astronauts thinking about what's out there. Could there be more life? To you, Fabian, what <laughs> is down there? What do you think is down there? So I think um, as, a general, as a general response, I would say we would be very egotistical and, and very short-sighted if we thought that there wasn't other life in the universe. Of course there is. What form that takes, I have no idea. I would assume that there's probably a lot of life out there that's much more advanced and much more intelligent than we are. But that said, as far as ocean exploration, without a doubt, because we've explored less than 5% of our ocean world to date, there is a lot left uh, to, to discover, especially a lot of life left to discover underwater. What form that takes, I have no idea. But I really look forward to seeing it. All right. I, I am too, because I, you know, I think I was mentioned to you before on the show. Uh, I just picked up surfing and I'm trying to get my friends to come out, but they won't go out because they're, they're afraid about what's out there right now. So <laughs> God bless you and God bless everyone that is exploring the ocean. I think that's a fascinating feat. Now we just talked about leadership. We talked about the theme of what's going to impact uh, today's decisions and impact tomorrow. Uh, integrity uh, is a great trait of leadership. Now, Fabian, to you, what is your definition of a real leader? Someone that has passion, someone that is willing to bring a community together, and someone that is willing to take that first step in the charge uh, to whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and most importantly, someone that is willing to understand when they're wrong, to listen to other people, to take those things into consideration and to make the best decision for the group that they're leading. I think that uh, at the end of the day, the, the 
a, a real leader is one that pushes the boundaries of the known, that goes into places that others may be scared to go. Uh, and to be willing to be criticized for that, to take responsibility if it's the wrong direction, uh, and to give credit to those who supported him or her if it is the right direction and it does come back to benefit people. So um, it's a person who is uh, a musketeer, I guess, one for all and all for one, right? <laughs> bold bold Fabian hey I, we appreciate you coming on the Realtors podcast it was a pleasure getting to know you a little bit today and getting to know a, a lot about the, the underwater exploration the ocean exploration that I hope our audience can enjoy and be inspired by and hopefully pay more attention to uh, and that's sea life so Fabian just appreciate you coming on the Realtors podcast for Fabian Casto. I'm Kevin Edwards asking you to go out there push boundaries of the known and always folks make your children proud <laughs> make your children proud keep it real Fabian, thank you so much. Thank you, guys.